any of you eat them. <laughs> so, uh, as, as we set up this conversation today about the Relief Society, um, I, really, I really hope we will keep it in our context. And a couple of the contexts that, that should kind of be on the back of our mind right now for the, uh, the genesis of the Relief Society was that what the brethren were doing simultaneously. At, at this very time, the men of Nauvoo have organized themselves into the Nauvoo Legion. And so kind of that, that military, paramilitary idea of, of an organization structure, that we all have our place, we all have our duty, and we all have our assignment. Simultaneously, Joseph Smith is studying the ideas of the Freemasons and the idea that we bind ourselves together in covenant. And the book of Abraham and the idea of the, uh, the stars all orbiting each other. And this, this vision in Nauvoo of this giant chain link fence of network. I think that's important for us to, to bear in mind as we go forward. We tend, we tend to see now our connections linearly. We, we see you know, family trees going one direction, kind of. And if we've lived in Box Elder County a long time, they're straight in both no, directions. But the, the Nauvoo Saints, the Nauvoo Saints really saw this network, this kinship of all Latter-day Saints. And, and that's going to be significant to us as we continue our conversation. So, so keep that, that fertile ground in your mind. As we also remind ourselves, as we do every lesson, the, the main thing we want to do is have the Lord speak to us. Uh, to teach us personally how he would have us be better saints, uh, and which is the, the 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 arc of all religious education, the revelation that you receive today is is the most significant thing. And please remember, please remember with anything we talk about church history, especially Nauvoo, if you ever have to try to explain this to somebody who cannot understand the very, very complicated nature of the chain link fence, and they think you're an idiot for believing in, in such a thing, please be in good company with Paul who says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. I'm okay if you don't understand an empty tomb. I do. Leave me alone. And... The Lord has laid in Zion a stumbling block and a rock of offense. Do you remember the Greek word for offense? Scandalon. Today's, today's scandal may be actually a little topical. Carol Lee shared with me this morning a message from the, uh, uh, the counselor in the General Relief Society who had, who had said a nice thing about uh, the opportunities women have in the Church of Jesus Christ. And then... Uh, a billion posts came up about, nah, -uh, not in my ward. Well, let's talk. Let's just embrace the scandal on. Let it, let it be scandalous, and we will make it. We will make it our story. So now on to the good stuff. The idea of the female relief society. Um, it fits in the context, actually, and and. Very nicely, I, during my, uh, my master's degree, I had to take some classes on women's history, which were fascinating to me to look at stories that we normally look at and, and for me to take my bias aside and, and see this as a, the idea of the American woman in the 19th century really is defined kind of in four evolving and, and connected parts. The first idea of the American woman the, the uh, white American woman. This story wasn't the same if you happen to be enslaved or, or native, but um, the first idea of, of the American woman, if, if we lived in the 1800s, the historians call this the deputy husband. It is, it is the name for someone who is equally engaged in making sure that we don't die. That's our single goal out here on the plains or in the woods of Ohio or Connecticut. Don't die. 
So, so the role of the woman was, was equal to the role of the men in not dying, which meant that sometimes she had to shoot the squirrels and sometimes he had to cook them up and sometimes they both had to, uh, you know, gather buffalo chips for wood. It was just, don't die. Everybody, don't do it. And so if your spouse died, either you got ready to, to die or you got another one. And, and so you, maybe you've seen this in, in your genealogy, but, but family structure was almost interchangeable just because don't die. As, as Amer Americans got a little more wealth, a little more capable of paying somebody to help us not die, the uh, kind of the next vision was the vision of the Republican mother. And, and I can't think of anybody better than Abigail Adams to, to depict this idea. Um, if, if, as you study American history, we tend to say, you know, George Washington and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson, Washington, Adams were just pillars. But you just don't find anybody like Abigail who is encouraging and pushing and and a, a voice, a, revolution, a revolutionary voice to her husband. And the great, uh, the great honor to this Republican mother is not that she was married to John Adams, but that she begat John Quincy Adams, who, who is one of the greatest Americans. Read the John Quincy Adams biography someday. He, he had a horrible four years as president because Andrew Jackson is a jerk. But he, he, as his term as a diplomat, his secretary of state, after he loses in uh, his loses his reelection bid, and uh, he, he runs for Congress, he runs for Congress and wins for Massachusetts and becomes probably the greatest voice of abolition in American history. So much so that uh, that the House of Representatives passed an, a law or a, an order called the gag rule that he couldn't speak about slavery. And, and so he just kept trying to find back doors and channels. Guess where he died? On the floor of the house. He, he had an aneurysm and they brought in a couch and left him there till he passed because the nation just owed John Quincy Adams and thus the Republican mother. You get that idea, right? You see that uh, the, the woman's role did tend to become more specifically feminine, but seemed deliberately significant to the next generation. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. That still kind of exists with us to some extent. And then that evolved into the cult of true womanhood and the circles of domesticity. Catherine Beecher, who is the, the uh, sister of, of Harriet Beecher, Uncle Tom's Cabin and and daughter of Lyman Beecher and all the famous New England Beechers. But while her sister is fighting for abolition, um, Catherine fights for education. And just this idea that if we can have a, a more elected or educated populace, we will have more power. And who she wants to educate are the girls and the women. And then she wants girls and women to become teachers. As, as this becomes what you, what you might say a, a feminine type work that, that women should do more of, said Catherine Beecher, as she promoted this, this cult of true womanhood and the circle of domesticity. And so the next evolution stage from, uh, and I'll use Lucretia Mott to, to represent this, was the, the womanhood and benevolent societies. So part of this can be seen as a middle class evolves and as, as people have discretionary time, you know, they're not, they're not killing squirrels every minute of the, of the day. So if I'm not killing squirrels, and my husband has enough money so that we don't have to eat squirrel, I can collect other women around me, says Lucretia Mott, and we can pick a cause. The causes in the 1800s that we owe to, to women of our culture, uh, to a large extent, abolition, to a, a, a huge extent, social reform. You know, the, the benevolent societies would go into, 
into New York and Philadelphia and Boston and try to rescue the, uh, you know, the children of the street and, and the, uh, the soiled doves and close the saloons. And all this became kind of the, the woman's sphere, eventually pushing to, uh, to suffrage, right? Now, as I explained all of those things, as nature, uh, as our history has evolved, I promise you, you can see these in our grandmothers. Every one of those stages. And what we notice is, is with the exception of the deputy husband, which was just, that, that just wasn't was what it was for everybody. But it absolutely is, tip, is typified by our grandmothers because we are a culture, we've, our, our history is a history of frontier life. The frontier New York, frontier Ohio, frontier Missouri, western Illinois, and, you know, the blessed desert of the West. So that was a big deal. The Republican mother, absolutely, we can hear those echoes. Uh, the uh, circle of domesticity and the, and the benevolent societies were probably, probably 20 to 50 years ahead of the rest of the nation. Just like, just like suffrage, right? Um, Utah, uh, Utah women were voting before anybody else in the union. Wyoming, Wyoming gave women the vote first, but we had an election before. So, right? Thank you, Wyoming. We win. <laughs> they passed the law first. Um, yep. So that, that is how our grandmothers, our, our, these sisters, came up with... Every time, I think it's a revelation. And then... <laughs> <laughs> Somehow in my mind, when God calls to me, that's what it's going to sound like. So, As these sisters get together with this idea of creating a benevolent society, a group of women who are going to band together in order to help the poor, the afflicted, the, uh, the, the abandoned children, the soiled doves, all these things they want to make a better society with, and they vote. They vote for Emma Smith. She, she wasn't called by prophecy in the laying on of hands. She was voted in by, uh, by unanimous consent of the sisters who wanted her to be their leader. This is a, this is a cool picture of Emma Smith. And, and the photograph that is most closely to this moment in 1842, this is a picture of her in 1844, um, in November 44, with her son David, with whom she was four months pregnant at the time of the martyrdom. This is, this is just the past uh, post martyrdom Emma Smith, and you see, do uh, you, you ever study just old photos and try to understand a person by looking at them? And I can feel the weariness. I feel her distress and, and bless her. And you know, that picture, some people think that's the after having children. That's, that's uh, got that uh, look in her eye, isn't it? And that shows up even in, as she ages. That's, that's true. Um, then Emma is given the responsibility, or, or then, then the rest of the, uh, the meeting proceeds by parliamentary order. And it's quite interesting because then the, uh, they make a motion. It's proposed that Elder Taylor vacate the chair. President Emma Smith and her counselors took the, It was proposed that Emma Taylor vacate the chair. Maybe was that maybe that's the sound of when you're called up. <laughs> Some of us get an Irish tune, others get a robot. I see a principle in this. So John Taylor, John Taylor of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, John Taylor is conducting this meeting. And it is proposed by the sisters that Elder Taylor vacate the chair. Then President Emma Smith and her counselors took the chair. Here is a, here is a hypothesis that I present to you as, as one who has sat in presiding authority. Sisters, 
you don't need my permission to get revelation. I say these things. That I think sometimes, sometimes men of our church think we have to point to somebody so she can be in charge. And sometimes sisters in the church wait around till, till the guy stops talking. And the answer is, it is proposed that Elder Taylor vacate the chair. And then President Smith, President Smith and her counselors took the chair. Her counselors, oh, yeah, yeah, this is interesting to me. Then Joseph Smith moved that they should have a president. They should address her as, as Mrs. President or Mrs. Chairman. And that if any officers are wanted to carry out the designs of the institution, let them be appointed, set apart as deacons, at teachers, and etc. among us. Well, that is interesting. Not deacons in the Aaronic priesthood, and not teachers in the Aaronic priesthood, but teachers of the Relief Society and deacons of the Relief Society. Do, do we still have them in the church today? Well, yeah, we just, we, we still use the term teachers and, and deacons, uh, the, the responsibility of the deacon to take care of the, uh, the welfare needs of the saints. I'll say, every sister in, in visiting or ministering sister is uh, really a deacon of the Relief Society. And I, you, you don't need an 11 year old's permission to, to serve the poor, right? Is proposed that Elder Taylor vacate the chair. Um, here are her counselors. Sarah Cleveland is called as first counselor. She was married to a, a non Latter day Saint living in Nauvoo, and uh, uh, she's a member. When the Saints go west, she stays back there with her husband, who is a judge, and lives happily ever after. And, and Lord bless her. Elizabeth Ann Whitney, we, we know her. She's been with the Saints from almost the beginning. She's Newell Whitney's wife, living in the store when, Joe, when uh, Parley P. Pratt and Oliver Cowdery show up as missionaries. And do you remember anything about her from Kirtland? The idea that, uh, that she listened to him, and then she told Newell she was going to get baptized. And Newell said, well, let's, let's listen to a few more, you know, Charles. Let's get another lesson. And she said, no, I'm ready. And she goes and gets baptized. That is proposed that Elder Taylor vacate the chair. Um, and then... The secretary nominated Eliza R. Snow, so these minutes are in her handwriting as she keeps a record of, uh, of what goes on in the Relief Society. And so let's take a, a look at uh, some of the first records. This one actually comes out of Joseph Smith's journal. After the uh, Relief, Relief Society is organized, after uh, Emma is sustained, set apart by John Taylor, uh, or ordained is the word they used, by John Taylor, um, Joseph gives a lesson on Doctrine and Covenants, section uh, 25, the elect lady who is going to be ordained to expound the gospel. And then he says, that this is how he records what he said, gave a lecture on the priesthood, showing how the sisters would come in possession of the privileges and blessings and gifts of the priesthood, and that the signs should follow them such as healing the sick, casting out devils, and etc., etc., that they might attain unto these blessings by a virtuous life and conversation and diligence in keeping all of the commandments. Interesting. I'm, we're going to come back and, and, and dissect this a little bit. Here's, here's how Sister Snow heard that message. This is his, his journal. Here's Sister Snow's minutes. Uh, signs such as healing the sick, casting out devils, etc., should follow all that believe, whether male or female. He asked the society if they could not see by this sweeping stroke that wherein they are ordained, it is the privilege of those set apart to administer in that authority which is conferred on them. And if the sisters should have faith to heal the sick, let all hold their tongue and let everything roll on. He, the, that line refers to something further up in the paragraphs in Joseph Smith's talk about some people say women can't do stuff. And so the end of his talk is, uh, yes, they can. Let everybody hold their tongues. Shut up. <laughs> so let's take a slight tangent and talk about the idea of, of women and authority. Um, so after the beginning of the Relief Society, even after the Relief Society 
was kind of dissolved as the Saints started west. When we got to winter quarters and, you know, we're just living in cabins and trying to survive, the Sisters, the sisters of Zion created the original ministering network. They visited the homes, they delivered the babies, they, they cared for the sick and afflicted. Every one of these eight sisters, and most of them you've heard their name, maybe all of them, but every one of these eight sisters gave blessings for the healing of the, the sick and the afflicted. And uh, I'm not going to time travel and tell Marianne Angel Young that she's out of line. She looks like she could handle her own, but I'm scared to death of her husband. <laughs> Eliza Partridge is a daughter of the bishop. Uh, Sister Pratt, Mary Fielding, widow of Hiram. Sister Richards, uh, uh, a, a wife of an apostle. Sister Kimball, Sister Whitney. Patty Sessions, who probably delivered one of your ancestors. She was a midwife who just, you know, delivered every baby. So what have, what can we learn? Let's go back to, to, uh, to Joseph Smith's quote. Um, is there anything that you see in there that intrigues you or that explains a better philosophy of women and authority that maybe we we miss sometimes just with, with traditional colloquial Mormonism? That was a long question, but do you see anything that's interesting? Yes, please. Well, it's the thing that we tend to hear in history that the men do, but we don't hear much about women doing it. There's a gap. There, there, there is a gap in our history. It is true. Let's, let's dissect a little bit of this with the, some questions. What is the source of priesthood power? Jesus. It, it's, not, it's, it's not the handkerchief. It's not the seer stone. It's not the shadow of Peter. It's not Peter, Right? It is, it is God, the Eternal Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. I've thought about this quite a bit, and I, I guess the question that comes to my mind, and maybe that's totally not even a story, but if, if they were doing these things or able to do these things, and I assume that any of us, could, any of us women could do that if there was not a priesthood person available, a priesthood holder available, how... How did they do that? Did they call upon the priesthood of the, of the Savior? Yes. Yes. I, and now I've got some more as we unpack this that maybe we can answer some questions. In the Jewish study of Orthodox and several weeks ago, one of the chapters of the Gospel is the Chapter of Matthew and Claudius. And it says, Go to the side of the house and the side of the church. And then Paul writes, Go to your side and then go to the side of the church. Ah, nobody forget that. We're going to say we're com coming back to that. What are the prerequisites of having the power of God in our, in our lives? According to, if you were to just quote Joseph Smith, what's the prerequisite? You see, that's section 121, that no power or authority can or ought to be uh, uh, exercised by virtue of the priesthood only upon the principles of righteousness, right? It tells us that it's gentleness, meekness, persuasion, long-suffering, love unfeigned, virtuous life, conversation, diligence, and keeping all the commandments. 
that, that those things are the prerequisites of God's power flowing through us, right? God's power flows through us according, whether for, for men and women, for anybody, according to virtuous life and conversation and diligence in keeping the commandments. We all know that. Let's look at Eliza R. Snow with the same question. She's uh, talking about uh, after President Smith reads from Matthew, or excuse me, Mark, about the signs that will follow them that believe. And then it's point, pointed out that this healing the sick, casting out the devils, will follow all that believe. It is faith. It's belief. It is belief that opens the door of godly power, godly blessings in our lives. Then he said. Then she, re, uh, Sister Snow, records that he said, "With this sweeping stroke that wherein they are ordained and set apart, it is their privilege to administer in that authority." Right? I. Everybody ought to understand this. Since 1842, says Joseph Smith, everybody ought to understand this. I I'm I did it get better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now here's kind of where we see the gap. And this might explain some of it, but uh, Elder Joseph Fielding Smith wrote to Sister Bell Spafford, uh, while the authorities of the church have ruled that it is permissible under cert certain conditions and with the approval of the priesthood for sisters to wash and anoint other sisters, yet they feel it is far better for us to follow the plan of the, lo the Lord has given us and send for the elders of the church to come and administer to the sick and afflicted. Joseph Fielding Smith of the Quorum of the Twelve uh, Writing this, he's kind of the uh, he's kind of the uh, answers to gospel questions guy at, at this period, and he says, "Here's here's the protocol, Sister Snow. What has changed? Well, Elder Smith taught us that it's a scripture protocol to call upon the elders. It is it is an elder's duty to be there to administer to the sick. It says it in James. So let's." Let's let the elders do that. The idea of washing and anointing for health stopped in 1922. That was a that was a thing. People went to the temple, went to the endowment house to be baptized for health, to be washed and anointed for health. Um, not not a proxy for somebody later on. It's just so that I can get feeling better. We've we've evolved as a church a little bit, and we've said, I I don't think that's what that was for. I don't think that's what baptism was for. And so we've not baptized for health in any of our lifetime. You know, we I don't know any of us who have a memory of of I had pneumonia and they took me out into the creek and baptized me and and then I got better. We we, we just don't do that, including all the temple workers whose calling was to be healers in the temple. They were released. We, 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 we will do ordinances, not healings, in the temple. This that, changed. That would replace, I mean, having the priestly blessing, so why bother? Right? right. The idea of anointing the afflicted area of the body when giving a priesthood blessing changed. We used to say, if you've broken your arm, we would anoint your arm with, uh, with consecrated oil and lay our hands upon your arm and say, I bless your arm to get better. Wilfred Woodruff tells stories about his, his wife passing and how he anointed uh, and blessed all of her that she would get better. Well, now you understand, I think, a little bit why women were giving so many blessings in winter quarters, especially to other women. Ailments like pregnancy and, and other womanly ordinances or ailments required an anointing 
that would have been uncomfortable to invite an elder to be part of. So what's changed? Well, now, now we just anoint with oil on the head, wherever, however. And sometimes, sometimes we even just shake our keychain enough to get a little moist <laughs> smear on our finger, and we, we count that because it's, it's symbolic. We do this symbolically. Mm. She heals by faith. And there was one example in India where a woman came to her and asked her to give her a blessing of healing. And Corey didn't know what she was, what her illness was. And this woman came to her a year later, and that blessing had healed her of leprosy. And Corey admitted that if she had known it was leprosy, she would have had enough faith for that one. <laughs> Was it was it Corey who cured the leprosy? Yeah, Corey didn't do it. No. Well, no. Right? She she if if we will train ourselves on this idea that we are all we are all just conduits. We are all just extension cords and if we are plugged in to God by virtuous life and conversation and diligence in keeping the commandments then God's power will flow through us to whatever else gets plugged into the other side. Right? I think this, this goes to what you said. Now, this is something, this is a personal hypothesis because you know this scripture. Uh, you know this scripture relates to baptism. Baptism for the dead. That we started doing in the Mississippi River and the Lord said, what you're doing is too holy for the river. While you're poor, you can do it in the river, but this ordinance belongeth to my house and can't, cannot be acceptable, acceptable to me only in the days of your poverty wherein you're not able to build a house unto me. If we look into our history and we say, why was Eliza Arsenal giving so many blessings in winter quarters? There was not a house unto his name. Why did we stop in the 1940s? This ordinance belongeth to my house. And this, this is one that, that is, is, we walk carefully on this because not all of our sisters would understand that this, this explanation of priesthood power and authority flowing through a woman because it's, it's, it's behind the closed door. But none of us, we, we all validate that. This ordinance belongeth to my house. Has it gone away, Sister Snow? Depends on where you're looking. Also this. Oh, that was out of order. Where does healing come from anyway? We, we've solved that equation. And who's to say that the laying on of hands is the only way to exercise the gift of healing? Seriously. It's not. Well, I believe that, that women, through power of faith, I believe that women, even not knowing that they were conduits of God's power, I believe that women have been healing the sick in our culture for 200 years. Just even think. Think of your own experiences. I was once, when I was a sophomore in high school, building a fence with my dad, and I fell down and broke my arm. And I turned to the priesthood holder in my life, and I said, this really hurts. And he said, no, wrap the chain around the post. R wrap it all the way around the post. And I said, I can't. This hurts too bad. He said, uh, go tape an aspirin to it, which, which was the priesthood holder in my life's way of telling me to not be a big baby. So I went to my mom. I, I, went, I, I went to the healer in my life. The one in my world who had the gift of God, the gift of healing. She took me to the doctor and he put a cast on it. And I wrote with my left hand for a half a semester, which was the greatest gift 
God had ever given me because nobody could read it. And so I was writing nonsense. <laughs> My mom did help write some papers. Right? Let us here resolve. Let us as a, as a congregation admit that that healing power has flowed through the women of God's kingdom longer than we know. And we say, oh, there was a gap. There's this gap between Relief Society sisters talking about God's authority and, and it was ordained women that kind of brought that to the surface. Hmm, nope, nope, it's always been there. It has always been there. Nothing has changed since Joseph Smith in Nauvoo. Amen. Hallelujah. Now back to the good stuff. Controversy resolved. Scandal on obser of, uh, uh, observed. Then, uh, the Relief Society, uh, the meeting, this is uh, Sister Snow's minutes, the meeting was addressed by President Smith to illustrate the object of the society, that the Society of Sisters might provoke the brethren to good works in looking to the wants of the poor, searching after objects of charity and in ministering to their wants, to assist by correcting the morals and strengthening the virtues of the female community, save the elders the trouble of rebuking, that they may give their time to other duties and in public teaching. Sisters, help, help the elders do their job. Search out the poor and the needy and take care of them. And hunt down sinners. It was this commission that really kind of turned the Nauvoo Relief Society into, into a network of spies. <laughs> so let's take a slight tangent. One, one of the objectives, as the sisters saw it, and here's a, here's a poem from Sister Snow about Relief Society. What is it? It is an institution formed to bless the poor, the widow, and the fatherless, to clothe the naked and the hungry feed, and in the holy paths of virtue lead, and to stamp a vetoing impress on each move that virtue's present uh, dictates disprove, to put the tattler's coinage scandal down and make corruption feel its withering frown. Well done, sisters. <laughs> and as they began to examine the society of Nauvoo and the chastity of Nauvoo, uh, a stink begins to arise. Now, President Bennett started out uh, you know, from investigator to Nauvoo's favorite son. Doctrine and Covenants, section 124, speaks to him. Let my servant, John C. Bennett, help you in your labor in sending my word to the kings and people of the earth and stand by you, even you, my servant Joseph, in the hour of affliction. And his reward shall not fail if he receive counsel. I have seen the work which he hath done which I accept if he continue, and will crown him with blessings and great glory. We, we hear the name of John Bennett in church history, and we, we wince. We, it's almost like uh, Purim. We want to shake rattles and hiss. Boo! John Bennett. And historians will often say, Joseph Smith was a terrible judge of character, said a famous historian, right? You recognize him? Yeah, he's famous. Was Joseph Smith a bad judge of character? Uh, yes, because he tended to give everyone the benefit of a doubt and was phenomenally forgiving. Phenomenally forgiving. But is John Bennett an example of Joseph Smith uh, being a terrible judge of character? Tell me about John C. Bennett from 124, from section 124. Who's the bad judge of character? No, because what, what is Jesus saying to this man with a shady past? 
He has potential. That, that's the judge on character. That's the judge on character that Jesus Christ made on John C. Bennett. He lived a horrible, in what by a lot of standards, a very wayward life. And the Lord says, I accept you. That, that verse, ought to, these two verses out of 124, ought to just be a part of our national anthem. Because that's true for John C. Bennett. That's true for, for Uncle Leroy. It's true for a wayward child. It's true for me. There are a couple of things that, that we do notice in here that should teach us a little doctrinal message about conditional prophecy, though, right? A, a two-letter flyover word. If. If. I, I sometimes listen as we teach ourselves and we teach in our lessons that that everything unfurls according to God's plan and because He knows the end from the beginning, everything happens exactly the way it's supposed to happen. And I disagree. <coughs> I believe God knows all things. I, but I believe that the future in all things is absolutely conditional. In kind of a Marvel Universe timeline, what... what would it have been possible for John C. Bennett to have been the greatest hero of the Restoration and, have, and be right now wearing an eternal crown of blessings? Could he have been exalted? Yeah, that, that's, that's a possible timeline. Jesus was not messing with Joseph Smith and John Bennett by giving them a prophecy that couldn't be fulfilled. Yeah, he's going to be great. Take him in. No. He really did have potential. Our patriarchal blessings that say, here is something that's, that is your potential. If. If. The morning of the first resurrection. If. That that's, uh, ought to be a sacred doctrine to us. Yes. Well, the good things he did, he did well. I mean, it looked like he had wonderful potential. Right. Don't, know, don't, don't we all? Um. He, you're going to labor to send my word to kings and people of the earth. He, he helped to the servant Joseph with the Nauvoo Charter. He, he was doing well. The Lord wasn't messing with him. He was doing well. And then, then we find out about his ad adultery. Uh, Hiram Smith and the High Council are investigating. The Relief Society are, are investigating. And uh, three women testified that Bennett and Elder William Smith had taught them that spiritual wifery was approved by Joseph Smith. The, uh, the idea of, uh, of having multiple sex partners because our spirits are bound. And our, the, you know, the heavenly is more important than the earthly. It doesn't matter if you were baptized by a Catholic priest. That doesn't count in the restored gospel. So it doesn't ma marry, matter if you are married by a Baptist priest because that it's, it's the spirit that counts. Now, oh, how we want to throw rocks at John C. Bennett, but what do the sisters testify? Who else is in on, in on this? Elder William Smith of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. That is right. I would, tell, I would tell you one thing to make sure that we continue to think about spiritual wifery. I'll tell, I'll tell it to you in a minute. Um, at this moment, uh, Bennett confessed his sins, resigns as mayor, weeps and begs for forgiveness. And so uh, the, the High Council and the Relief Society continue their investigation that he has taken advantage of close contact with female patients in Nauvoo. As, as a doctor, he has been taking advantage of people. He made promises to perform abortions to keep his trysts secret. And, and uh, several people came forth later that Bennett was both prescribing a medicine um, to prevent or abort pregnancy and also had showed somebody at one point a medical implement with a hook on that he was using to... Uh, destroy the fetus, as it, as it said. Um, he tried to poison a husband, of, the husband of a woman that, with whom he wanted to pursue a relationship, and that he, he frequented and, in fact, 
was establishing a brothel in Nauvoo. I've, every time I go there, I talk to the, uh, the missionaries and ask them when they're going to reconstruct the brothel so, <laughs> so we can go to the store, get a cookie, get a brick, get a horseshoe. Well, I'm not. Stop. I, I just want a missionary couple to stand there and talk about John Bennett and talk about forgiveness. He's disfellowshipped by Joseph Smith and he confessed his sins to the Masonic Lodge. He cried like a child and begged that he might be, be spared. And Joseph speaks in his behalf. Is Joseph a bad judge of character? Now the famous historian, you'll, you'll read this in a lot of histories, that uh, Joseph was forced to walk a thin line as he tried Bennett for sins that he himself was trying to cover up. So historians take this, and the brush that they will paint this with is Joseph Smith's a giant hypocrite, and John Bennett was his scapegoat, because Joseph Smith was, uh, was in plural marriage. Joseph Smith had pl plural wives at this point. But when John Bennett tries to have a plural wife, boom, he gets that communicated. Here is what a careful historian has to learn. That what Bennett and William Smith and, and the Fosters and the Higbees were doing was not the same as what Joseph Smith was doing. So what we are left to understand is what it was that made it different. What element, what element was different that made plural marriage uh, of a righteous lean and made John Bennett's spiritual wifery a, a, an absolute sin? And our problem is, one of the problems that we Latter-day Saints of the modern era have is that we culturally are overly exposed to sex. It's, it's in our movies, it's in our TV, it's in our novels, it's in the public. And because of that, our first assumption, our first assumption of what was going on is usually carnal. There's a biography uh, about Abraham Lincoln that uh, talks, uh, it talks about how, as a young lawyer, he shared a, a bed in an apartment with, with another man. And, and then it talks about how there have been accusations or implications that Lincoln was homosexual. And then the author says, generally speaking, those assumptions say more about where our mind is than where Lincoln's mind was. So I'm, I'm inviting us all as we prepare to look at plural marriage in Nauvoo in our next lesson, that we bear in mind that it's, it's not the seedy thing that Bennett was doing. Um, all right. In the Relief Society Minute Book, it says Joseph Smith in, in May. This is a couple months after the Relief Society's organization. There is another error which opens the door for the adversary to enter. As females possess refined feelings and sensitivities, <laughs> they are also subject to an overmuch zeal, which must ever prove dangerous and cause them to be rigid in a religious capacity, should be armed with mercy, notwithstanding the iniquity among us. He goes on, said he had been instrumental in bringing iniquity to light. It was melancholy and awful that so many should place themselves under the condemnation of the devil and going to perdition with deep feeling, said that they were fellow mortals. We loved them once. Shall we not encourage them to reformation? We had not forgiven them 70 times 7, as our Savior directed. Perhaps we have not forgiven them once. What is, what is Joseph Smith saying to the, the secret police network of Nauvoo?
we we have we have too many critics don't we we have created sometimes in our faith so many critics that we are all a little punchy of taking correction we just we just feel that uh if we miss miss a basket we are going to be benched if we write a bad paper we're we're not going to get an a we have too many critics says joseph smith to put words in his mouth and what we need are some more cheerleaders. We know Brother Bennett's been horrible. He brought iniquity to light. And how should we feel about that? Melancholy. I'm not... Oh. The feeling of a member's council or disciplinary council, the feeling of listening to somebody discuss discuss their failings. The feeling that comes from the Spirit is melancholy. Not disgust, not revulsion, and not, not an anger to, to react and punish. The feelings I have ever had on this issue have been that what I need to rule as a judge in Israel, what I need to prescribe is education. Here's how we learn from this mistake, not punishment. Here's where I'm going to get my revenge for you being so horrible. I'm going to get revenge in the name of God. I'm going to teach you in the name of God. Joseph Smith is reminding these sisters that they are becoming, they are coming under a, uh, uh, opening the door to the adversary. What? How is calling out sinners opening the door to the adversary? I thought that's that's fixing them. How are you feeling about it? Are you feeling holy about it, or are you feeling are you feeling uh, darkness? That's that's my thoughts there. Early. Right. Sometimes even our feelings about God are that that's how he must feel toward our sin. And it, that comes from kind of a sovereignty doctrine, kind of the idea that that a king must punish uh, those who've go, gone astray or else it will lessen his authority over the group. And then I, we ponder on that and we say, what effect do my sins have on God's glory? None. What effect do, does my good work have on God's glory? Also still none. God's glory is God's glory. So, what is his response going to be to me as a sinner? Is he got to be, does he have to be punitive to teach me a lesson? Or to uh, prove that he's, that he's the boss? No, he needs, he's going to be educative. He's, he's not going to feel that feeling of betrayal. He's going to feel the melancholy and the desire, the desire to rescue the wayward. Uh, in my head, I've been wrestling on this one. I just don't take it as authoritative, but uh, sometimes the hardest thing as a bishop I had was not helping the penitent person uh, come back into into good graces of the, with youth. It was. It was convincing their mother that they could still be a good boy. Ah, sometimes that was so hard. This is always hard. When we look back at Nauvoo and we see the immorality, we wince, we feel melancholy. Hopefully we don't feel betrayed anymore. Hopefully we won't let those feelings rankle us. And we can come to this with a feeling of benevolence and the desire, the desire to retain the wayward soul, and uh, 
Orson Pratt comes home from his mission to, to dozens of accusations that his wife Sarah has been immoral while he's been on his mission. And Bennett, who is, who is uh, now on the outside, Bennett doesn't want to take the blame for his immorality, so he twists it onto Joseph Smith. It was Joseph Smith who proposed to her. It was Joseph Smith who, who is the scoundrel. Uh, Sarah was silent on this. She, she never said anything till the 1880s, decades after this, after the fact. And in, in the 1880s, she, she does come out as a staunch anti-polygamist. And for that, she calls herself an apostate because she, she just thinks polygamy is awful. But it's not, it is, as I've read her, uh, her affidavits or her statements, it's not because she thinks Joseph Smith was bad to her. Her problem with plural marriage was him. It could be done wrong. We'll just say. I love this picture. They painted in their daughter Lydia, who passed away as an infant, um, just at the time of, of Orson's mission to England. Uh, Sister Pratt will raise the, these children outside of the faith. But she'll have, she'll have 12 children with Orson. She's a good woman. And how do we feel about her? We want her to come back. We want her to be part. We want the blessings that were pronounced upon her in the Nauvoo Temple of, of eternity, of, of, of immortality and eternal life. We want those blessings to come true. Bless her. How did Orson feel about this. He came home and flipped out. Of course you would. And uh, votes in publicly, gives a, a, a vote of no confidence, I guess what we would call it in parliamentary world, he gives a vote of no confidence against Joseph Smith. They present a motion to the congregation that Joseph Smith be upheld as a person of moral character. Those in favor, please manifest. Are there any opposed by the same sign? Boom! So the Quorum of the Twelve, the three members of the Quorum of the Twelve tell Orson he's out. And he, he becomes suicidal. Um, Parley goes searching for him. Par Parley is his brother, right? Parley goes searching for him. Finally found, finds him distraught, down, sitting on a rock down by the river. Brigham Young hunted him. The president of his quorum hunted him. Why? Brigham Young and Orson would fight till, till 1877, till President Young's last breath. They fought, they fought constantly. Most of the things they fought over, by the way, we today in our theology follow them what Orson was teaching. Mostly we say, yeah, Orson was right. But Brigham said, I will rub his ears until he gets this right. He also said, he also said, if you slice Elder Pratt up into one inch squares, which he maybe was thinking about doing, he said, if you slice Elder Pratt up into one inch squares, every one of those squares would shout, Mormonism is true. Because President Young went and found Orson. And Parley, Elder Pratt found Orson. And they bring him back. And then Joseph Smith says, oh, no, you were never excommunicated. He said, no, I was excommunicated by three members of the Quorum of the Twelve. And Joseph says, three of twelve is not a quorum. That doesn't count. Vetoed. Vetoed excommunication. Work time is spent. It would be easy for me to cover these next points because we've already covered them. What else came out of the uh, Female Relief Society? What we've been calling the key of knowledge. This idea of, of not only a divine feminine, but at this point in Mormon history, what's Joseph Smith teaching? Not just, not just that we have an exalted father, but that 
we can become like our exalted Father. And I gave you this quote by Zina Huntington early. And on these two quotes, well, and, and Parley Pratt, learning about eternal families and ceilings, which we'll talk about next time. But all of this, all of what I've been teaching for the past four weeks is a prerequisite in, our, in this graduate history class before I can tell you anything about plural marriage. If, if you try to understand plural marriage without understanding all of the things that we have just discussed, you will get it wrong. We get it wrong. We're ready for next week. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, everybody.